Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long. As always, it's my pleasure to have back with me Charles Hugh Smith, well-known and prolific writer on the web and in public uh, print uh, media books, who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Gordon. Always a pleasure. Charles, I'm going to jump right into today's session. Um, This is the second of our three-part series, which we've entitled 2018, Year of Accelerating Social Change. The three parts are entitled Time for a Change, Social Change Accelerating, and Preparing for Major Social Change. Today, we'll focus solely on social change that's accelerating. But before we jump into these points on this chart, is there anything you'd like to mention or kick it off? Just that um, in part one, we, we talked about um, the sources, if you will, the, 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 the dynamic um, engines that are driving social change. You know, this, they're cyclical, um, they're technical, they're financial, and they're political. And so um, we're basically picking up those threads and um, going to discuss further uh, the manifestations of, of, of the pressures for, for change. In other words, what's the outcome? We, 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 we discussed the pressures. We know that change is coming. What, what's the sort of outlines of the change we anticipate or that we see people talking about now? So that's our program today in, in my mind. We did at least one, maybe two shows, but one show specifically on the millennial generation, the 73 million um, you know, working age under the age of 33 size, the the change that they're going to bring. And one of those changes is their acceptance and um, thinking towards what I'll call socialism. We saw it blatantly with their support of Bernie Sanders in the last primaries uh, during the uh, the last presidential election. We're seeing it throughout Europe. I'm seeing it in in Latin America in many ways. this, This belief that capitalism isn't working though I believe that we're not allowing it to work, but that's a personal opinion. And this shift to socialism will solve a lot of the problems because right now they believe the system isn't working for them. Comments on, on, on whether you're seeing the same thing? Gordon, you're right. We did do um, a, a whole series on the millennial generation mm-hmm. and um, and the uh, the traps that the, uh, that the millennial generation finds itself in in the sense of of high debt to get through college and the fact that the uh, university diploma no longer guarantees the secure um, good paying job that it did in previous decades and so um, their this response to socialism of course is is cyclical as well and we talked a bit about cycles in part one and um, Really, uh, we could go back to the Great Depression as a template for um, socialism being seen or social type spending, social programs as being the solution to the failure of that form of capitalism. Now, you and I call the current form of capitalism crony capitalism or corporatocracy. It's not it's not really free market capitalism. Free market capitalism is, um, you know, uh, the uh, the farmers market you know it's in these little pockets of the of the economy but the overall economy is controlled by cartels and monopolies and that includes higher education healthcare military contractors um, all of the uh, the main structures of our of our economy uh, banking are controlled by cartels and they're um, so it's not really capitalism but setting that aside. This version of capitalism, crony capitalism based on financialization, has failed the bottom 80% to 90% of the population. So socialism looks promising and there's a template for it. In other words, the 1930s and, uh, and uh, President Roosevelt's uh, New Deal and all these um, social spending programs. And so it's very tempting to look at that as a solution. But the problem with that, in my mind, is centralization itself is failing. That's the source of so many of our ills, is centralized power. And so the problem with socialism is that it's basically um, concentrating even more power in the hands of the few. And um, unfortunately, one of the what that brings is insiders feather their own nests at the expense of everybody else. And so I'm not sure that socialism is going to be the answer that so many people think because of the corruption of our of our um, economy 
and uh, our, our system of governance. And so, and I've written a, a lot about universal basic income because that's one of the uh, core um, kind of policy changes a lot of people are seeing as a solution. In other words, uh, uh, universal welfare uh, payments on a monthly basis to every adult, regardless of whether you're working or not working. And uh, my problem with that is there's still a lot of work to be done. Robots aren't going to do everything. And so, uh, in my view, what we need is guaranteed paid work, meaningful work. But um, I, I'm a voice in the wilderness compared to the, the proponents of universal basic income. The degree of, of acceptance that we're seeing of socialism, I, I, it's a reflection to me, not necessarily about socialism, but it's a belief that the system we have isn't working. And it's the only thing that they can see that's closer to something that would work for them. And in the case of the millennials, it's call, it's called, hey, if socialism happens, maybe my uh, student loans will be absorbed. They'll go away. And at least then I have a shot at a better life and getting out of my parents' basement or possibly being able to, this poor paying job I have now, uh, be able to get ahead based on that. So it's almost out of one out of desperation. It doesn't solve the problem. And so history is replete with proving that as a point. But when you have limited options, you go with the best choice that you have. What troubles me as much as that, uh, Charles, is this movement towards populism from our political leadership. This is a time when you really need leadership to be able to articulate clearly what's the right kind of direction. Why not socialism where capitalism is failing or what new forms our society needs to move to? We have none of that. That is not even something that's put on the table. Um, and, and, and so what's happening is, and part of that is the media's control and gets into the other point here, they tie together very close, is this polarization that's happening in our political process, either you're on the far right or you're on the far left, it would appear. But as my opinion, that's not where people live. They live in the middle. They're in the gray areas. But we've got to such a point that you're either black or white in terms of of opinions on things, fixed extremes, that um, that aren't, aren't, aren't realistic with how a society works. And therefore, debate goes away. Um, political correctness harnesses people, if I can use that expression. So the, 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 the lack of debate of what the new system should be or the changes that uh, need to come is, is missing. And it was like the comment we made in the last show, you know, the, the de defined benefits gone away and contributory benefits, medical education are not being discussed to the degree they should. Heck, Entitlement programs that are underfunded by close to eighty-four trillion dollars in the United States total over the over the next couple of decades, a few decades, is not even something we're talking about. We're not building the nursing homes and everything else to absorb seventy-five million baby boomers that are retiring at ten thousand a day, and we'll see a million a year that are hitting seventy here next year. So, I mean. We're, we're not even preparing and we're not talking about the, the, the real problems. That is a problem. Right. No, you're absolutely right, Gordon. And I like what you said. Um, I'm going to bring it back in something you, you said from the, our first program, which was um, so much of the population feels left behind because they are, have been left behind. You know, the wealth and power have have accumulated in the very top of the of the of the social pyramid and most people are left behind in terms of the purchasing power of their income their and their um their level of financial security going forward and they and you also pointed out that the elites are not listening in other words people realize they're not being heard and so you know the human response to that is to start shouting right in other words if you feel like um people are blowing you off and they're not listening to you, then you, you ramp up your, um, your, your intensity. And so this is part of the polarization we're talking about is that, well, if no one's listening to me, let me say it even louder. <laughs> and so, um, and then you, you know, we're, we're, we're getting these tribes, as you say, where in, in, when, in periods of instability and insecurity, then the one of the few forms of security that humans have is to join a tribe where everybody's repeating what you believe. And of course, this is the foundation of religious wars. And, and frankly, I often feel like we're entering a period here 
uh, where there's a secular equivalent of the Thirty Years' War between uh, Protestantism and, and Catholicism, you know, back in the 14 and 1500s, um, where you're either you're, you're one or the other camp. I mean, there's no you have to decide whether you're uh, pro or con on these on these polarizing issues. And as you say, that's not the solution. You don't solve things that way. Uh, two quick points is well, I you know this whole point, Charles. Sorry to interrupt. And uh, in yeah. terms of terrorism. That we, you know, on the surface, we've got so. I mean, you, I've seen the face of Europe completely change, and these terrorist events that will so will will say majority, but not all, are associated with uh, extremist uh, fundamental. It's the Muslim Islamic shift. But I clearly need to say that's not all of them because we have so much domestic oriented terror also and cultural. These are these little camps that are growing and how they can fight back. There's a reason for a lot of this terrorism. You know, with a lot of them, they've been, they've been bombed, their families decimated, their homes destroyed. They've had to leave, and they're angry and they're vengeful. I'm not trying to defend it. Terrorism is indefensible, but the, this is what's changing social change. You go through Europe, the fabric of Europe is changing. I'm stunned to see how how it has since it's changed since I was there and living there. Sorry to interrupt, right. but I just you're. Your, your 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 mentions of these small groups is is so critical here, and then again it goes back to this polarization, extreme beliefs. Right, right. Uh, and there's two other points I'll quick I'll try to make quickly. One is the status quo has two basic ways to solve problems: more, doing more of what's already failed. And we've covered this with financialization, and we see it in political things. It's like whatever's already failed, we're going to do more of it, and that's supposed to solve the problem. And, of course, it only makes the problems worse. The other one is TINA. There is no alternative, T-I-N-A. So what we see is we see doing more of what's failed because there's no alternative within the status quo. And so what, what the, sol- the, the, the solutions have to come from outside the status quo. Um, and, and when we look at the social fabric and the political structure of, of our society and, and, and developed economies in general, all of the policies come from the 1930s and the 40s. You know, that's, it's like the social welfare and social security systems were set up in the 30s and then the post-war World War II economy – with large corporations working hand in hand with centralized government, central banks, all of these structures were created 60, 70, 80 years ago. And so they, they've run out of steam. They no longer work. And yet the status quo has no alternatives. That's why we're in a bind. It's stunning when you consider how much the world is changing at what speed in every area, just simply technology, and yet our institutions our method of governance, et cetera, are not changing, not right. at all. Look at what cryptocurrencies are doing to the whole ability to trade and money around the world, and we're almost fighting them. This is the, these kinds of crises are change trying to happen, and that's why this we have this you know major social change underway. We're gonna have to break here, Charles, because but we're you know in part three, we'll actually discuss this a lot more, preparing for major this major uh, social change. And we'll in that session we're going to discuss the, the, what it means in terms of wealth distribution issues, and as I just mentioned, the governance issues associated with this 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 new world that we are, is clearly already here, but we just fail to want to recognize it. Any closing comments? Uh, no, I'm looking forward to discussing um, potential uh, fixes, you know, and solutions because that's always part of our programs. You know, so we, you know, we want to lay out the problem, but we also want to. Uh, sketch a, a, a path to solutions. Thank you, Charles. Talk again. Okay.